Okay, howdy. Uh, I was thinking about writing emails about this book, and then I thought, why not experiment with video and see if people prefer that. Um, as I mentioned, I was going to start talking about this novel, L'Aventure Ambiguë, written by Sheikh uh, Amidou Kane, uh, to you uh, writings and musings subscribers. Uh, and I haven't written anything to this list in a long time, so I guess prologue is, why do I think this is worth talking about? Why do I think it might be of interest to you? Um, for a long time, I've had sort of separate boxes in my head for issues that I'm thinking about as far as what's relevant in the West and what will be relevant in West Africa. And this book brought those two things together in a big way. Uh, I think I'll just start by sharing about the author and the background of the book. Uh, and so I'm using a new recording software. This is something of an experiment. Okay, so this is the author, Sheikh Amadou Kane. He wrote L'Aventure Ambigu in 1961, which is, a, I believe, just a year after Senegalese independence, after Senegal was granted independence by uh, France and was brought from under the colonial government. He is uh, a Fula man, son of a chief, and so as a boy, he went through rigorous Quranic Islamic education. Uh, the first thing you do in uh, a young boy's education in West Africa and throughout much of the Muslim world is the children have to learn to recite the, the sons have to learn to recite the Quran in Arabic. And after he had completed his Quranic education, he was ambitious and keen to go to the most prestigious high school available, although at the time only uh, white European background students went there. Uh, instead, he was sent to the high school destined for sons of African nobility who were to become Canton chiefs. Uh, but it, it was even after, even while he was there, it was his ambition to study philosophy at the more prestigious high school, and he was able to excel and <clears throat> achieve his way there. And then, desiring to study in France, he wrote to the colonial governor of Senegal at the time, who for the first time was a black man from the Antilles, and uh, he requested a scholarship and was granted it. And so he studied at the University of Sorbonne. He studied law and philosophy. And on his return to Senegal, he was appointed as the first post-independence governor of Chess, uh, a, large, a large city near Dakar. And then in time, he served as a minister in economic policy under the first president, Leopold Senghor, and the second president, Abdou Diouf. And so this story is somewhat autobiographical. Uh, Samba, the, the main character in the novel is Samba Diallo, who is a young boy who grows up in what is a fictional country in Senegal, but, you know, is more or less modeled off after the Futatoro region that Amidou Kane is from and who experiences a degree of dislocation and uh, philosophical and meaning crisis over the course of his then Western education following his Quranic training. There is some divergence in Kane's story and the story he's telling because Kane found that his uh, Islamic faith was not shaken but enriched by his time in <coughs> France. Uh, but nonetheless... There are, uh, let's say, autobiographical aspects in there, and he identifies Samba's, Samba Diallo's struggle in the novel as representative of the struggle of many African elites and intellectuals of his era. So while he might have had a crisis of faith, he certainly saw it. Now, the reason I want to talk about this is what's happened in the West, one thing that's most relevant in the West right now, uh, among my generation, but for many generations now, is what's being called these days the meaning crisis in the <laughs> circles that I listen to. And so I wanted to define what the meaning crisis is. And then back when I'd intended to send this as an email, I wrote out this explanation. So if you'll forgive me, I'll read it. What do I, <clears throat> my goodness, what do I mean by the meaning crisis? In short, 
after we, that is, the West, discovered the technological power of science, of treating nature as so much inert, mechanistic matter, the scientific approach at some point escaped the lab and started being applied to all of knowledge. Empirical sensory phenomena became the supreme and then the only accepted source of real knowledge. So rationality is exalted above uh, revelation, tradition, uh, above intuition, you know, above the ancient sages and other sources of what had been accepted fixed forms of knowledge. Rationality, one among several ancient sources of understanding, was elevated to the highest and then the sole epistemological tool. Inevitably, this objectifying, deconstructing tool was applied to the very human consciousness that had wielded it in subjecting nature to its purposes. Thus arise such questions as, is there a ghost in the machine after all? Are we only so much stuff? inert but for the deterministic patterns of electrical signals and neurotransmitters that give us the illusion of spirit is the heart no more than a pump stars just balls of burning gas is love but a chemical reaction is my wife any more than a highly complex steam engine am i just as hackable as a lab rat whammo that's <clears throat> the meaning crisis uh i should note that i'm very indebted for my meaning crisis uh, articulations to the likes of Pastor Paul Vanderclay uh, and Dr. John Verveke. John, John Verveke has a 50-episode series uh, unpacking the meaning crisis from a philosophical and cognitive science understanding that has been a lot of what I've been chewing on to think about these things. Back to the quote. <clears throat> Before the scientific lab leak, as Pastor Paul Vanderclay likes to call it, we belonged to nature, our mother, and the world was alive. God was the most real thing. Material stuff, rocks and trees and animals, that was the most illusory thing, the most transitory, the least lasting. God was the most real thing, the thing that endures. Then, after the lab leak, the way of viewing nature only as so much stuff to be hacked, to be controlled, after the lab leak, <clears throat> we divorced ourselves from nature, and we started looking at nature as our subject to control. In time, we went from being the dust of the earth and the breath of heaven, the lowest spirits looking out at a universe teeming with gods and angels, to being at the top of the pyramid, but only an intelligent ape. We went from being at the bottom of being in a living and meaningful world to being top dog, but it was objectively a demotion because we became clever animals. Material stuff became the most real thing. God, the illusion. From servants of God, we became masters of meaningless matter, condemned at best to invent meaning for ourselves, knowing at bottom that it's all projection. That's the meaning crisis of the West, Nietzsche's death of God, and it's all around us. So that's what I mean when I talk about the meaning crisis, and uh, a good visual illustration of this I pulled from a Hans Ruckmacher lecture that was given at Labrie in 1976, and here's that excerpt. Tonight I will show you a slide of a etching by Max Klinger. It's a fascinating thing, made around 1890. And the artist shows us the philosopher. He calls it like this. And you see a man looking at the world. And you see, so from that side, you look at him, you see him looking at the world. There's a beautiful landscape. And very soon that man finds out that he's looking at himself. He's looking at himself. It's fascinating to understand. You see, if you say the sun sets, the scientist sets beside you says, man, you're old fashioned, crazy. The sun sets, the sun doesn't set, the sun is still there and we're just turning around and there's some kind of breaking effects of light and that's all. Forget about it, nothing special. So if you say it's a beautiful sunset, everything you say is your invention. There's nothing out there. 
There's certainly nothing beautiful. You made you said the beautiful is yours. So that means that if I'm saying there's a beautiful sunset, what I'm saying is I have invented a beautiful sunset. That means I'm looking at myself. At my own invention, there's nothing out there. And this is one of the results of this way of thinking. We make the world. We make the norms. We make everything. And the world is one big machine, objective, but we add to it. And if the world is wrong, of course, we got to change this. And there you have the Marxism and all the things of today. We're going to change it. How to unmute myself after the video. <coughs> so, if there is nothing but matter, then all meaning is projection, and all projection is ultimately illusory. It's, it's, it's fantasy. But we do it because we're highly evolved animals and we're driven to survive, etc., etc. You're familiar with this stuff. Uh, and of course, the West has had hundreds of years <laughs> since the uh, Enlightenment to wrestle with these ideas and to try to come up with uh, s solutions to argue about how we are going to proceed. Now, imagine being a young colonized African who, rather than having generations to digest this stuff, just gets dropped into it. I mean, people in my generation become nihilistic and... Uh, addicted and isolated and kill themselves over the meaning crisis. But to be dropped in, in, into it as a young boy over the course of a single education, that's what this book is about. Um, <clears throat> the whole idea of looking out at the world and discovering we only see ourselves, that there's no there there. Uh, that's also reflected in C.S. Lewis's uh, observation of, in the abolition of man, of the two men, one who calls the waterfall pretty, the other who calls it sublime. Is there anything in that waterfall that is sublime or is sublime? If I call it sublime, am I just saying it makes me feel sublime things, but there's nothing any greater about that waterfall than this sticky note. There's no beauty in the world. There's beauty in me. So that's the meaning crisis. And I've probably said enough about the meaning crisis. One other angle at it, though, is this idea of domicide, the death of the home, and I think isolated from home and going through a Western post-enlightenment education, Sambadiello experiences a domicide, and uh, to get an angle on that, I'm going to read a couple paragraphs from this John Verveke paper. <clears throat> He's speaking of the work of another scholar named Walsh. Walsh discusses the Anishinaabe, of the Grassy Narrows First Nation who live on a reserve in northwestern Ohio, 80 kilometers from Kenora, near the Manitoba border. They were relocated there in 1963 by authorities in the Canadian Federal Development of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. Motivation for the relocation was well-reasoned. I should let you guys see the text. Sorry. Uh, motivation for the relocation was well-reasoned. Access to a variety of provisions, including schools, roads, electricity, healthcare, institutions, and employment opportunities, would be considerably improved. Most significantly, the housing that the nation was provided was br provided with was brand new and infrastructurally upgraded. They had more power and more protection against the elements. In a very short period of time, Grassy Narrows was spared from the modest conditions of their old reserve and inaugurated into the life of contemporary suburban domesticity. What followed was an effect that few individuals, and apparently no one within the federal department, managed to foresee. By 1970, the Grassy Narrows Nation was the site of some of the most severe social and familial disintegration, together with environmental dis despoliation, des despoliation? Despoliation? Despoliation. ever to be seen in North America. Cases of domestic conflict, violence, and suicide exploded in number. Employment plummeted. Welfare dependency increased as much as, and as many as 1,000 people showed symptoms of being infected with Minamata disease caused by mercury dumping upstream. By the mid-80s, the Grassy Narrows community demonstrated the numbness of spirit and utter hopelessness that rivaled any third world situation. So, objectively, all of their material 
all of their material well-being is improved. All of their conditions are improved. But something, a spiritual crisis has occurred. And this is what uh, Walsh terms domicide. Strip a people of that sense of place, deprive them of the space that they feel is necessary to establish such, such a sense of place, and they are rendered homeless. Following Walsh's definition, the loss of home may be called domicide. Humans are animals, this is a Walsh quote, humans, who are, humans are animals who most fundamentally understand what reality is, who we are, and how we ought to live by locating ourselves within larger narratives and meta-narratives that we hear and tell, that constitute for us what is real and significant. When such narratives collapse, we are lost in the dislocation, fragmentation, and disorientation of homelessness. In short, one suffers from a worldview crisis. One runs the risk of losing the plot. And of course, if we look around, we can see that the Western, Western civilization has experienced a domicide as uh, many of our intelligentsia, many of our guiding lights have concluded that there is no larger narrative or meta-narrative. It's just us. We are thrown into the world and we have the responsibility of creating meaning. And so we come up with new narratives like the myth of progress, like uh, the Marxist narrative of you know, seizing the means of production and the materialist utopia, and so on. So I have already taken 16 minutes talking about the prologue as to why I think this book is important, or at least the laying that out. I think this book is important because these are the things we wrestle with in the West. And the most standout line of this book to me is when Samba Diallo's father, who is not happy about him being sent to France, to, to the colonial school, or to France to be educated, he tells the French schoolmaster, we have not shared the same past, you and I, but we will share the same future. And that connected some dots for me to realize that the meaning crisis <laughs> is coming to West Africa, whether, you know, Christian missionaries go and challenge religious assumption, assumptions or not. Facebook is coming. Uh, you know, the existentialists are already there. Online pornography is already there. Consumerism is already there. <clears throat> All of that will come no matter what. And uh, there's a passage later in the book where Samba is reflecting after some time of his philosophical education, and he tells a French pastor who had intended but been turned down by superiors to start a mission in Africa, he tells him, you know, if I was, if, if, <clears throat> if the direction of my people was incumbent upon me, only with great reluctance would I admit any doctors or engineers. But I sure wish you had been able to send evangelists armed only with the word of God and in imitation of Christ. And uh, so anyway, a little point where we're going. I won't drag this one on by starting into the excerpts from the book, but when, we, when I share the next one, it will be about the chief of the people, the Quranic schoolmaster, and the chief's cousin, uh, as they are wrestling with the decision, do we tell the people to send their kids to the colonial school, or don't we? So, I hope that's of interest to you. If it's not, then I'm sure I'll still get things out of this from doing that. Okay, peace be with y'all, and uh, may the Lord teach us through re reflecting on the experiences of the early generations after colonialism and into independence. Okay.